Well, good evening. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are doing a series on the Sermon of the Mount. So tonight, the topic is loving our enemies. Loving our enemies, something that's easy to do. We're going to be pulling our scripture out of Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to verse 43. That's where we're going to pick up our teaching tonight. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you again for uh, just another day, Lord. It seems like these weeks are flying by. And you know what, Lord? None of us are getting any younger. <laughs> we're all getting older. You know, we're just getting closer to going home to be with you, Father. And I just pray for tonight's teaching. I ask that you would anoint it, Lord, that you would speak to us mightily with these words that uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is going to teach us tonight, Lord. God, thank you for how good you are. Thank you for what you continue to do in our lives and what you uh, are going to do in the future. So go before us now, Lord, and uh, help us not to get sidetracked, but to focus on what your spirit is saying to your church this evening. We love you and, and we welcome you here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Loving our enemies, verse 43. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So what Jesus is saying here carries the core of Christian ethics in the character of God, in the character of God. I mean, these verses teach Christians are to love others, not, not as a man loves his friends, but as God loves. If we don't get the heart of this teaching, you know what? We're going to miss the whole point of what Jesus is saying. <sighs> totally over the head. The standard is the kind of love only God is capable of. For one thing, verse 45 says, we're to do this in order to be sons of our heavenly Father in heaven, that we might be godlike in our conduct. How many of you know God's love is without discrimination? I mean, think about it. Think about it. It extends to the just and to the unjust alike. It's the same. Well, our love is also to be without discrimination. In fact, our love is to express itself in action. We're to show that we love others, that we care for them. I mean, we, we're to love those who are, by, by all human standards, our enemies. <laughs> Again, this isn't a human standard. You guys know that. I'm preaching to the choir. It's a divine standard. And the word for love is here in our passage. Now, let me give you a little background to love. In the Greek language, there are actually four words for love. The first word for love is one the Bible never uses. You never see this one in the Bible. It's the word eros, E-R-O-S, eros. It refers to sexual love. I mean, it's where we get our word erotic. 
In biblical times, the sexual love of the Greeks had become so perverted, so debased, that the word eros was rejected in biblical language as something that, that was contaminated. So that's why you can't find eros in the Bible. It's interesting, the same thing happened years later when Jerome came to make the Latin translation of the Bible. He chose the Latin word caritas and rejected the equally common but erotic word for amor, amor, love. In 1 Corinthians 13, the older authorized version of the Bible speaks of faith, hope, and charity, but not love. It doesn't use the word at all. The second Greek word for love is storge, storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, and it refers to a family love. This is the love a father and mother has for their children and children have for their parents. I mean, this word isn't in the New Testament either, even though it could be. The third word for love is philia, P-H-I-L-I-A. It refers to strong affection. I mean, from it we get a love for music. <laughs> we get the name Philadelphia, which means city of brotherly love. This was the word Peter used when Jesus asked him if he loved with the highest of love. Remember in, in John chapter 21, in verses 15 to 17, Peter, conscious still of denying his Lord, replied, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. <laughs> it's the highest love that man in himself is capable of. And then there's the fourth word for love. You guys know what it is? It's a divine love, agape, A-G-A-P-E, agape. It's the word Christ used the first two times he put his question to Peter. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? It's the word he uses here in the Sermon of the Mount. This is a love that loves without condition. Without condition. I mean, it loves even when the object of the love is hateful or unlovely. It could be called a love for no reason at all. Or love even when there are plenty of reasons to discourage it. This is a God-like love. You see, it's a love like this, not erotic, not family, not even affectionate love. That's to characterize yours and my life as God's children. We're his kids, but we haven't really seen the true extent of this divine love until we go one step further. It is true. The love to which we are called is God love, agape. I mean, this is a love that exists completely apart from the possibility of being loved back. It's like, no matter how much you hate me, no matter how much you're my enemy, no, no matter what you do to me, no matter, I don't care, whatever it is, you can count me as an enemy, whatever you want to do, I'm still gonna love you with that God-like love. You think that's easy to do? That's hard to do. It's very hard. So the question is, where do we see this love if it is God love? <laughs> where is it demonstrated? Are you sitting down? Are you ready for this? We see it only in Jesus. Guys, we see it in Jesus at the cross at the cross. In reading through the Bible once a year, I've noticed there's hardly a verse in the New Testament that speaks of God's love without also speaking of the cross. Man, that's where God demonstrated his love for you and me, terrible, stinking, wretched sinners. I mean, we all deserve hell, every one of us. I don't know, I don't care how good we try to be. 
that's where God demonstrated his unconditional love. It, it suggests those who were writing the Bible, as we know they were inspired by God. They acknowledge God's love to be seen there and not anywhere else. Let me give you some uh, illustrations of that. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul, writing to the believers in Galatia, said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 John 4, verse 10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 5, 8, another killer verse. I love it. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Are you ready for this? And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice in each case, the cross is made the measure of God's love. The cross. I mean, it's not, it's not just the fact of Christ's suffering that makes God's love so awesome, so incredible. It's the fact he suffered for sinners. For those of us who were in ourselves naturally repulsive to him, we were. I mean, you know, the Bible tells us over and over that sin separates us from God because God is 100% pure. He's totally pure. The only way we could have come to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. Let me, you know what? Let me ask you guys a heart-searching question tonight. Would you give your life for one of your loved ones, knowing they would live and you would die in their place? I mean, really think about that. Really think about it. Would you give your life for theirs? Now, you're probably thinking, well, I'm not sure, but I think I would. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you. I mean, many people would do it, or at least make the attempt to do it, right? But now, picture in your mind the most contemptible person you know. The most terrible person you know. The one who has wronged you. Or maybe he's cheated you. Maybe he's a total pervert. Maybe a murderer. Imagine him in a place of being put to death. Would you give your life for him? Think about that. I mean, it's not easy to answer that question, is it? Now it begins to show us something of the love God has for us. Guys, you know as well as I do, we can't make it to heaven on our own. We're not good enough. We're sinners. The best we do for God is still tainted with sin, man. <laughs> Listen to this. A man had a dream. He was on his way to heaven, and before him stretched a long flight of stairs. As he started to go up, he was given a piece of chalk and told that he must put a chalk mark on each of the steps for each sin he had committed. When he was about halfway up, he met the pastor coming down. He asked why he was returning. The pastor answered, I'm going to get more chalk. <laughs> Man, we're just sinners. 
We're sinners. We're saved by God's grace. It's the only way we're going to heaven. Thank God for Jesus Christ. A powerful scripture is Romans 5, verses 6 to 8. Let's know what it says. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, in the context there, while we were still sinners, you know what the implication is? When you and I were doing our worst, our worst sinful things in the world, whatever it was, at that very moment, Jesus died for us. I mean, that's heavy. That's love. That's unconditional love. I mean, just imagine it. While we were hideous to God because of our sin, he loved us and died for us. Let me put it this way. Say you were caught speeding. You were doing 100 miles per hour. <laughs> Obviously, slightly out of the acceptable speed limit. Slightly. You go to court. And just as the judge is about to throw the book at you, man, someone steps forward and says, I'll pay his fine. I'll take the punishment. And you get off without paying the fine, without any punishment at all. You've been justified. It means you have been made right in the eyes of the law. Now, it doesn't change the fact that you were speeding, but the court now sees you as innocent. This is what Jesus did for you and me. This is what he did for us. I mean, there was no possibility of our ever helping ourselves out of our lost condition. There was nothing we could do. We were going to hell. It was final. It was a done deal. You see, people think there's something they can achieve for themselves spiritually. But the Bible teaches just the opposite. It says, apart from God's saving work through Christ, the natural man, who we were before we became a born-again believer, we cannot understand God's word. We can't understand Christ's teachings. In John chapter 8, verses 43, Jesus spoke to the religious leaders of his day. These guys were part of the Sanhedrin, the religious council for Judaism. And he said, <laughs> notice what he said, pretty amazing. He said, why do you not understand my speech? And he answered, because you are not able to listen to my word. What was Jesus saying? What do you mean by that to these religious leaders? You know what he meant? Follow me on this. He said the natural man has ears to hear, but he doesn't hear because the natural man cannot receive the Holy Spirit. He can't receive the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, verses 16 and 17? <clears throat> he says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, the paracletus, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. This is before Jesus even left the earth. He was talking once he left. He was going to send the comforter to live with us. That would lead us and guide us and teach us 
things about the future, prophecy, the Holy Spirit that would enable us to live the life that God desires of us. We can't do it on our own. I can't love my enemy on my own. It has to take the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. I mean, Jesus was making it clear. No one can be saved by receiving the Spirit as an act of his own will. Nobody can. You see, the, the unsaved person cannot use his will to submit himself to God's law. He can't do it. In fact, you want to you get legit here? They're impelled to rebel against it. Romans 8, 7. Paul laid it out to the church in Rome. He said, because the carnal mind, the natural mind, is enmity, enmity against God, hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Paul wrote again in 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. You have to be a born-again believer to understand what I'm saying here, what Jesus is saying, what God's Word says. You see, those who aren't saved you can understand God's truth. And to go even further, Peter says in 2 Peter 2.14 that the person apart from Christ has eyes full of adultery and cannot stop sinning. Can never stop sinning. You see, you put it all together and you see that God's Love is to be measured by the fact that we were sinners and unable to hear his word. We couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. We couldn't submit to his law. We couldn't understand his teaching. We couldn't cease from sinning. Jesus died for us so that now we could understand. We could cease from sinning. I mean, I know we're a sinner, but he's talking about habitually living in sin, continuing in sin. You see, Jesus dying for us, that, that's God's love. That's the full measure of God's love. It's that kind of love <laughs> that you and I are called to as his children, as his followers. At this point, you're probably thinking, well, Rick, if that's the standard, I may as well admit right now I can't do it. <laughs> well, that is true. In and of yourself, you can't do it. That love is possible only to those who Jesus can work in and through with his love those who have the Holy Spirit living in them. Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14 says that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. We've been sealed until that day when either we, we die somehow and, and go to be with the Lord or if we're alive. And I think many of us are going to be, if not most of us, will be alive when that trumpet sounds and the Father says, Son, go get your bride. Bring them home. Let's have the marriage supper. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Here's the deal. If tonight you are not a Christian, you have to start by becoming one. And then you have to ask Jesus to create that love in you. Or... You're probably saying, well, Rick, you know what? I am a Christian. If you are a Christian, but maybe you're far from the Lord. You're not walking like you know you need to be. You have to draw near to him. 
You have to ask God to work out that love in you. Peter, Peter was the one to say, if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. You know, it's also possible that you are a Christian and you're trying to walk with the Lord, and yet you find this love hard. I mean, in your mind, you're thinking, you know, that's really unattainable, Rick. I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, to like someone is to have a certain emotional feeling towards them. And because we can't fully control our feelings. You know what? It's just simply not always possible to like everybody. I mean, I'm not even sure that we should. God might like, might not like the way we are. But he does love us. And that's an entirely different thing. You see, love is not a matter of feelings. Love is a matter of the will. People can't separate the two. They want to go by feelings. They don't understand the will. Because it's of the will and not of feelings. You know what? It's something that is always possible. I mean, it can always express itself in good actions. We can do this whether or not we feel like it. Whether or not we feel like it. You see, if love depended on our feelings, think about this. It'd be foolish for Jesus to say love one another or even love your enemies because we know it couldn't be done. But if love is a matter of the will, and if our wills are surrendered to Jesus Christ, guys, I'm here to tell you this evening, it can be done. It can be done. We can love our enemies just as we can bless them that curse us. We can do good to them that hate us. We can pray for them that despitefully uses us and, and persecutes us. C.S. Lewis wrote something pretty interesting, and I wanted to share it with you guys tonight. He said the rule for all of us is perfectly simple. Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Act. Now you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, Rick. Time out, time out. Isn't that hypocrisy to act like you love somebody? Well, hold on. Listen to what he says. As soon as we do this, act like we love them, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will come to love them. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him even more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. The difference between a Christian and a worldly person is not that the worldly person has only affections or likings and the Christian has only charity. The worldly person treats certain people kindly because he likes them. The Christian, trying to treat everyone kindly, finds himself liking more and more people as he goes on, including people he couldn't have imagined himself liking at the beginning. You know, if you're having a tough time with loving others, try this suggestion and see if God won't use it to lead you into a fuller experience of his love and power. Act like you love them. Act like you care for them. Watch what happens. I'm speaking from experience because I've been there. I've had really severe hatred for certain people at times and you know what I just started acting like I cared and I loved him and God gave me that love to where I truly love him someone has said God has really given us five gospels five gospels 
the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke, the gospel according to John, and the gospel according to you. To you. <laughs> how, how then do men come to know God? They come to know him through Jesus Christ. How do they come to know Jesus Christ? You ready for this? They come to know him as they see him in the scriptures and in your conduct and life. In your conduct in life. People are watching you, man. They're watching me. They're watching to see how we are under stress, under trials, under drama. You know what? I don't do too well with all that. And God really has to enable me for me to overcome. I have my times. I certainly have my times. Here's the deal. You're the closest to people that they'll ever see in Jesus. You're the closest to them with you being a Christian that they'll ever see Jesus. You see, if they don't see Christ's love in you and me, guys, let me tell you something. They're never going to see it. You're not going to see it in the world. You're not going to see it on TV. It's all erotic. It's Eros love. It's different kinds of love. It's not that unconditional agape love. I love this story. It is one of the books of uh, an author, a Bible commentator, ex expounder, Dr. Harry Ironside. Many of you know him. And, and he illustrates this. It says, once when Ironside was in Ganado, Arizona, at a Presbyterian mission hospital there, he met a poor Navajo woman who had been nursed back to health through the work of a Christian doctor and the Navajo nurses. She had been cast out by her own people when they thought she was going to die and was found after three or four days of exposure. After nine weeks in the hospital, she recovered enough to begin to wonder about the unexpected care she had received. She said to one of the nurses, I can't understand it. Why did the doctor do all that for me? He's a white man and I'm an Indian. I never heard of anything like this before. The, Nav the Navajo nurse, who was a Christian, said to her, you know, it's the life of Christ that made him do that. And she said, who, who is this Christ? Tell me more about him. The nurse called a missionary to explain the gospel. The staff began to pray for her. Several weeks passed. Then a day came when she was asked, can you trust the Savior? Turn from the idols you have worshipped and trust him as a son of the living God? And the Navajo woman pondered her answer. The door opened and the doctor stepped in and the face of the old woman lit up. She said, if Jesus is anything like the doctor, I can trust him forever. And she came to Jesus Christ and accepted him as her Lord and Savior. It's seeing Christ in us. People have to see Jesus in us. I mean, they're going to see when we make mistakes. They're going to see when we blow it. They're going to see that. But they're going to see us repent of it, turn around, and get back doing what's right. You know, I want to close with pointing out what it was that reached this Navajo lady. It was love. It wasn't man's love. It was God's love manifest in and through a man, the doctor. You see, people see that. You know, there, there was a time when Steph and I had just gotten married and we became Christians. And I remember um, 
sitting in the front room and I was talking to Steph's mom. Her, her name was Virginia. She's with the Lord now. Um, she went to be with the Lord in the 80s. And uh, she, she just flat out told me, she said, you know, Rick, when you first started seeing my daughter, I didn't like you. I didn't want my daughter to marry you. And she goes, now I'm blessed. I am so thankful because God gave my daughter the best. And I just, it brought tears to my eyes. She just saw the change in me. I remember one night before me and Steph really started dating, probably about 47 years ago or so, I remember we lived across the street and I remember I, I went out at night and I snuck over and Steph opened up her window in her bedroom and I was talking to her. And all of a sudden her bedroom door opened up and I ducked down and I was, you know, kind of sitting there, ducked down. And I couldn't believe the words that Steph's mom called me and how she spoke about me. I mean, I was too hard to ever cry. But you know what, that night I cried. I went home crying because I couldn't believe someone hated me that much and didn't like me that much. And just before she had a massive heart attack and went home to be, be with the Lord is when she had told me what I just shared with you. You know what guys, we're to show this love to an ungodly and rebellious world and we're to do it as sons and daughters of our Father so that they will come to faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. People are watching us, man. We can do this because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, enabling us to do this. Chuck Swindoll said, friends come and go. Enemies accumulate. <laughs> I go, man, that's, that's for sure, amen? You know what? Here's the here's bottom line. Let's show some love. Let's see what God will do in and through it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, your love, your grace, Lord. And God, just the salvation we have through, through your son, Jesus Christ. We know our names are written in the Lamb's book in heaven. We know we're going to heaven. We know Jesus could come at any time for us. It just gets better, God. The world is getting worse. For us as believers, as bad as the world gets, it's getting better for us because we're getting ready to vamanos pa la casa. I mean, we're getting ready to hit it and go home, man. And we can't wait until you come for us, Lord. So, Father, until then, give us this agape love. Help us to love others as you, being a holy and pure God, love us, total, wretched sinners deserving of hell. Give us that kind of love, God. Let it be an act of our will. We can act on it. We can act like we do. And eventually, it certainly does come true. I've experienced it in my own life with people who had come against me and hurt me. And God, you're an awesome God. So Lord, I pray, bless the rest of this night, bless the rest of this week. Prepare our hearts for what you have for us Sunday morning as we continue our study in the Psalms. Such, such an awesome book of Psalms. It speaks about every aspect of life and what King David and many others have gone through. We're not alone. Everybody goes through what we're going through or have been through it or will go through it yet. It's what happens in this thing called life. It's called living the dream. <laughs> living the dream. So Father, bless the rest of this week for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. I love you guys. I'll see you there or I'll see you in the air. Amen.